morning and welcome to this Vine Community Church service. Uh, later in the service, we're going to be doing communion. So uh, now's the time to uh, go and get the things that you need for that. Uh, again, like last time, this does not have to be fancy. This is about what we remember and what we focus on during communion, not what we put on the plate. So go and find some bread or similar, some juice, some wine, whatever it is. And we'll see you later for communion.
a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide, where all the love I've ever found. Like a flood Come flowing down At the cross At the cross I surrender my life I'm in awe of you I'm in awe of you Where you love red, red And my sin was to white I owe to you I owe all to you, Jesus. There's a place where sin and shame are powerless. Where my heart has peace with God. And forgiveness Where all the love I've ever found Comes like a flood Comes flowing down At the cross, at the cross I surrender my life I owe all to you I 
Now's the time we're going to take communion together. So gather people around and make sure we're ready. Uh, and let's just stop and still ourselves before God for a moment. We read from Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it 
and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take communion together. This is his body given for you for the forgiveness of sins. This is his blood poured out for you for salvation and forgiveness and love. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the sacrifice that was Jesus, that is Jesus. We thank you that he died for us, for each of us, and then rose again in victory. We thank you that you'd have sent your son for each and any one of us. That you sent your son not because we do good things, not because we serve you, not because we obey you, but simply because you love us. So Lord, we just pray this week that we can just recognize your love for us. We also pray that we can go out into our communities, in our family groups, Lord, amongst our friends and neighbors, and we can just be the love that is you in that community. Help us to wait upon you this week, Lord, but also help us to go. Help us to go and speak your name into situations. Help us to go and be the face of hope in our communities. Help us to go and serve in this mission field that is where we live. Let us know your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start by reading to you from the book of Acts, from Acts 1. Uh, this is Luke writing, and he's really he's picking up from where he left off at the end of Luke's Gospel. And he reads like this. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. The passage begins with Luke saying that he wrote about what Jesus began to do and to teach during his time on earth. But that word began indicates that something goes on beyond that. That the teachings of Christ and the ministry of him goes on beyond the end of the book of Luke, through the book of Acts, beyond the end of Acts, beyond the point where we close our Bibles and into today. The ministry of Jesus began 2,000 years ago, but we're part of it now. And the commands that were given in this book are equally relevant to us 
as they were to those early apostles. Two commands were given in that passage in Act, Acts, and we've not read the whole passage yet. But the first command we've got to, and that first command was to wait. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Last Thursday was Ascension Day, the day that uh, many churches will have celebrated uh, Jesus ascending to heaven. And it's often used to symbolize time of waiting, the period between Ascension Day and Pentecost. It's a time between Jesus ascending to heaven and the Holy Spirit coming. We're in a time of waiting at the present. It's a bit of an odd time, an enforced time with COVID-19. A time when we're having to wait for restrictions to be lifted. We're having to wait for um, us to be able to come together as a church physically in this building. We're having to wait on our jobs and on much of our life. But it's also a time that we can wait on God. You see, this time of waiting for Jesus for the apostles, was not a time of lounging about. It was not a time of sitting, twiddling their thumbs, wondering what they should do. It was not a time of doing nothing, but it was a time of intentionally seeking God. The passage goes on like this, and this is verses 9 to 14. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight, the ascension. They were looking intently in, up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Verse 12 goes on. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the, from the hill they call the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot and Judas, son of James. They all joined together, constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. This was a time of prayer and seeking God for those early apostles. This was a time of preparation. The apostles took time to replace Judas. So it was not just about preparation in the spiritual sense, but they also made practical preparation for when this time of waiting would finish. They made sure they were both connected to God in prayer, but also equipped to serve and to take the message into the community. This time now is very similar. I really feel that, that God is calling us both into a time where we seek him, a time of prayer and of intentional seeking, but it's also a time that we should be preparing ourselves, preparing ourselves to do something. This is a time we need to be focus on, focusing on meeting with Jesus, but a time that as we search for his presence and we spend time in his presence through, through prayer, through being still, through reading his word, through taking a walk in nature, whatever it is that causes us to connect with God, it's the time that as we focus on that, that we should also be equipping ourselves to focus on our community. We should be praying together for our community. We should be looking into our community and praying for those individuals around us. And that's why the focus in, in this Thy Kingdom Come 
um, period that we're in, uh, as we work through the reflections each day, as we, we, we work through um, the, the prayer booklet that we've got, that we're focusing on five a day in this time between Ascension and Pentecost that we're focusing on praying for five people that we know. We're praying for them to be blessed, or to come to know Jesus, or to be healed, or to be protected as they work on the front line. This five a day is really important. And I want you to extend that. Let's go beyond five people. Let's think about five streets. Let's pray for the five streets around us that God will break out that blessing will abound. Let's think about five places, five places we've perhaps been connected with in our lives. For me, that could be where I grew up in Long Eaton and Sawley, or it could be where I went to university in Sheffield, or the places I've lived in Boston and Wibberton, and of course, Cherry. Or we may pray for five pr professions, five things that are really on our heart. This is a time for prayer. This is a time to spend time in God's presence and bring our woes and our joys and our thanks and our asks to him. difference between us as the apostles of today and the apostles of 2,000 years ago and the way that we are waiting. You see, the key difference is that the apostles back in, in the time of Jesus were waiting for something to happen. They were waiting for that gift of the Holy Spirit. But you know, We've got that gift. We've already received the Holy Spirit. So there's a subtle difference in the way that we should be waiting and the way the apostles waited. You know, there are three people that the Bible tells us ascended to heaven alive. Clearly Jesus. But there was also Enoch an ancestor of Noah. You can read about him in Hebrews 11, which simply says that after a very long and godly life, God lifted him up into heaven. And then there was Elijah. Elijah was a prophet in the Old Testament. You can read about him in Kings. You'll probably remember some of the stories some of the ways that he challenged the prophets of Baal, asking them to get Baal to call down fire to burn up a sacrifice. And it never happened. And yet when he prayed, God sent fire to burn the sacrifice, despite the fact he doused it in water. You might remember the story where he asked a widow for bread, and the widow had got barely any oil or flour. But she made him bread. And God miraculously kept those flour and oil jars from running out until the day the famine was over and Elijah left. Well, you may remember how God empowered Elijah to run ahead of King Ahab's chariot. He strengthened his body. God made him run in a supernatural way so that he was faster than a chariot and horses. Towards the end of Elijah's life, he had a student called Elisha. It tells us in 2 Kings 2 this. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. 
So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied. So be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophet at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied. So be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You've asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. Elisha spent his days with Elijah, following him, listening to him, being taught by him, mirroring the things that he did, learning from him. And we've spoken about how iron sharpens iron. But there was more to this than that. The passage goes on and says this from verse 11. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. When Elijah was taken to heaven, Elisha took on his mantle, took on his cloak. There was nothing special about that cloak. It was cloth. What was special was that he took on the blessing and the spirit, the Holy Spirit that had been with Elijah. And that's what the apostles were waiting for, that empowerment of God. But we already have that. We don't have to wait until Pentecost. Jesus empowers us. I don't know whether you caught in that that passage about Elisha and Elijah, but Elijah said, when you go, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Didn't say, let me be like you. Let me have the blessing of God that you have. He said, let me have twice that. Let me be more. Let me have more. And you know, That's what Jesus did when he sent the Holy Spirit. We read in Ephesians, it says this, 
and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. We were given incomparably great power. Jesus says that we will do greater things than him because we have, like Elisha, a double portion. Isn't that amazing? You know, we, we sometimes struggle to have the faith to get out of bed in the morning, but God has given us an immeasurably large portion of him, of his spirit. And, you know, we're to use that. We're not just to sit around and, and have that warm, fuzzy feeling or, or just use it to, to um, connect with God personally. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's great for us to do. But we're called to use that to continue Jesus' mission, to continue our mission. You know, I was on a, a, a conference call, a Zoom call, with leaders of a number of other ground-level churches this week, and we were talking about what we're seeing God do in the church. And, you know, it was amazing to listen to what other churches were doing. It was amazing for us to talk about some of the things that we're seeing happen here. And I'm not just talking about social activity. It's great that we're helping our neighbours and our friends, but, but some of the things we're seeing God do in people's lives. We're starting to see people do some things that they would have never have done before. And I believe that's because God's bringing a new time on us. This time of preparation. You know, I would have never expected Freya and Anne-Marie to produce that video that we've released. With Freya talking about prayer. I didn't ask them to do that. They felt called to do that. And that's an amazing. As they've connected with God then God has poured out his power and they're now stepping out and doing something for the community. Jan, setting up the Facebook chat. I didn't ask for her to do that. But that's really encouraging some people. Picking up the phone and playing the Sunday meetings to them so that they can hear that haven't got, uh, haven't got access to the internet. That's amazing. Alice, producing videos for the Promise Conference. For hope and for Amplify. I didn't ask her to do that. God's put something on a number of people's lives and he's empowering them to do that. Chris and Angela, taking on themselves to show the love of, of God to somebody who's really suffering at the moment. Putting in levels of support far beyond which we've asked to do as, as volunteers. I know I've lost loads. If I haven't mentioned you, that's not because God's not doing something amazing with you. It's because either A, I don't know, because you're keeping quite quiet about it, or B, I'm getting old and forgetful. But I can see God moving on people through this church. I can see people taking the mission that Jesus has called us all to do, to spread the good news, to become a beacon of hope in the darkness and point to him and just doing it. No fuss, no fanfare, just doing it. The mission that Jesus appointed to us before his ascension is to wait, but he's also to go. We read back in Acts from verse 6, then they gathered around and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, when they were asking about the, the kingdom of, of Israel, what they were ask, actually asking about was the kingdom of God. And, and I've heard people talking about um, that the times now point towards the second coming of Jesus. You know, people have made reference to, to the book of, uh, of Revelation and they've talked about the plagues and they've linked that to coronavirus. They've, they've talked about the role of world government and they, they've linked that to, to things like the World Health Organization uh, as a sign that Jesus is coming back now. 
Um, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's right. I certainly believe that Jesus will come back. I certainly believe that there's going to be a period when, when God will burst into human history in a spectacular way to establish his rule on earth. But I don't think we can know that's now. In Mark it tells us, but about the day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now if they can't know, then I'm sure that we can't know either. But I do believe that the kingdom of God is near and we know we're living in times where we're seeing God move in power and in amazing ways. And I believe that he's preparing us for more. So I do believe that Jesus will one day return. But at the moment, I think there's more for us to do. You know, those two commands of wait and the command to go seem to contradict each other. But I don't think they do. You see, you have got to follow them sequentially. Jesus is establishing a pattern for us. Wait on God and then go. You know, we should definitely not just wait on God. You know, we have to do things as well. And we should definitely not go without God. That's just a recipe for disaster. When we wait on God and then go, we go in power. The power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus states that he would join us through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the word baptism here doesn't just mean the normal be dipped or be immersed as you would with water. But it more, has more of a meaning of joining, of uniting with. When we wait on God and go, we do not go alone. We have the Holy Spirit with us. And Jesus in heaven cheering us on. Jesus intercedes for us. It tells us that in Romans. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. He's praying for us as we go. You know, one of my favourite stories in the Bible is the story of the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7. Bit weird, right? That one of my favourite stories is about a good Christian being stoned to death because of his beliefs. But just before that happens, something amazing happens. And it says this. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said. I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Jesus' ascension means that he is there cheering you on. He's empowered you with the Holy Spirit and he sits interceding with, your, with the Father on your behalf. In fact, he doesn't just sit. I think at times, like with Stephen, he stands in fervent prayer when you need it most. God is on your side when you live out your life for him. Colossians says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. We're to wait and we're to go. This is our mission. We're part of God's plan to spread the good news in word and deed, to love those around us, to serve, to stand up for the downtrodden, to get alongside the lost and the lonely, to pray for them, to help them physically, emotionally, and even financially, so that they may see God in us and turn to him, a God that loves each and every person. You know, the Bible says that Jesus is coming back. And I do believe that. And it says that he's going to reward the inhabitants of the earth when he does. We don't know when he's coming back. But we have a mission to fulfill. 
you know, I don't do that because I'm scared that he's going to come back and catch me not doing it, or even that he's going to come back and catch me doing it and reward me. I don't even do that because it says I should. I do that because he loves me. I love him. And I want to love those he loves. You see, Jesus wants more than anything to spend time with you. He invites you to return to heaven with him. To enjoy eternity with no more tears or pain or suffering. But he also invites you to join him today on earth. To have him beside you through the Holy Spirit as you walk your daily life. What could keep you from accepting this invitation of Christ? What would keep you from putting him first in your life? What's more important than saying, I want to pattern my life after Jesus and then live with him forever? You know, if you no, don't know Jesus, and, and, and this is something that is striking a chord with you, if you feel you're missing something, if you feel there's more to life than just, just the things around us, if you're feeling that, that you need to know somebody that loves and supports you, then now's as good a time as any. I'm going to invite us all just to, just to bow our heads, close our eyes. And you might want to pray this prayer with me. Father God, I recognize that you are real. I thank you that Jesus walked this earth that he died for my sins, for the things I've done wrong and was raised again to bring forgiveness. Today I ask that you come into my life, Jesus. That you be my Lord and my Saviour. In Jesus' name, Amen. It was great that you could join us today and uh, it'd be good if you could join us through the week. It'd be good if you could join us at our Zoom session of prayer tonight at 7 o'clock or midweek for our midweek group. Also, it'd be good if you could join us every day this week as we take part in the reflections heading towards Pentecost. If you've not got a book, visit our website and you'll find a link to download one. It just leaves me to pray a blessing. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.